First Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse number 15 tonight. I want to have a camp meeting service tonight. Everybody all right? How many like to have a camp meeting service tonight? Well, the camp meeting service means you can say hallelujah. You know I like that old boy that got saved. He, he was lost as a goose, but he loved you know, baseball and, and basketball, and he loved ball playing, you know, and he'd go to every game in the country and watch every game on TV, and, and uh, uh, he got saved, and, and of course he got saved while instead of watching the ball game so much, he'd go to church. Well, he just kept getting happy and happy at church, and he didn't know how to respond to when the Holy Spirit would just bless him. And finally, he just couldn't take it so much one night, a preacher was preaching, and I tell you, the Holy Spirit was blessing him. He jumped up and said, hot dog! <laughs> He did that two or three times. The preacher talked to him and said, now listen. He said, uh, say, say hallelujah, but don't say hot dog, you know. And the next Sunday night, he got the preacher, got the preaching, and he jumped up and said, hot dog, hallelujah. <laughs> anyway, so tonight you can jump up and say hot dog and hallelujah, all right? You can enjoy yourself tonight. I, I want to preach on something tonight that makes the devil mad. I mean, that makes the devil plumb mad. I want you to look at First Timothy chapter 3. Verse number 15 tonight, the Bible said, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Amen? The living God. And then it says this, The pillar and ground of truth. I want to preach tonight on some pillars of the doctrine of salvation. Now, if you don't like this message, you blame God about it, because I wasn't planning on preaching it until about 3 o'clock this afternoon. And the Lord began to deal with me about this, and so I'm going to preach it if it tear lips the devil. Amen? And uh, I want to preach tonight uh, on the subject, the pillars of the doctrine of salvation. I thought about this afternoon about this building. Uh, inside those there are white pillars, there's, it, those are, there's steel pillars in there, and there is about a 50-foot I-beam running right over my head. I sure hope those pillars hold it up, don't you? Because if that beam ever comes down, I'm a dead duck. I mean, it is a huge, big old I-beam that's resting on two pillars. Now, the I-beam may be strong, but if it wasn't resting on pillars, it would not be held up and it would not stand. God puts truths in the Scriptures that support doctrine. Doctrine is what the Bible teaches, what, the Bible, uh, what you believe, what the Bible teaches. Now, doctrine it must be supported by truths. And when you're looking and reading in the Bible and studying the Bible, you're looking for truths that are pillars to Bible doctrine. And so tonight, I want to give you some pillars on the doctrine of salvation. I'd like tonight to slay the giant of doubt. Amen? How many ever struggled with doubt? How many ever wondered if you're saved or not? I mean, you got gloriously saved, but you know what? The devil came knocking around some day, or you messed up and flopped up and fell in the mud hole, and, and all kinds of things happened, and you got uh, somebody hurt you, and you got wounded, and you got disappointed over here. And the next thing you know, you're down in the mud hole, and you don't even know whether you're saved or not. And I want to preach tonight on the doctrine of salvation, some pillars. Now, uh, a guy made this statement, and I don't know what his name is, but it don't matter, but he wrote in a, a book kind of this deal right here. He said, now, here's what he quoted. He said, if one genuine Christian can fall, slip away, apostatize, or be severed from Christ, not only will eternal security, the head of their idol, come toppling down, but so will the rest of her defiled body. Now, what that man was writing, he hated the doctrine of eternal life. And he was trying to write and, and, and tell that it's an idol, that it's a false doctrine that men have connived up. And he made the statement that if just one Christian can apostatize or be severed from Christ, in other words, the whole thing will fall. Now, I want to say tonight that the words eternal security and the phrase once in grace, always in grace, is not in the Bible. Amen? But the term eternal security, the term of the words eternal life are found 26 times in the New Testament. You can't read the Bible in the New Testament without finding the words everlasting life, eternal life, in fact, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Now I think it's incumbent upon us to define what is everlasting. To define what is eternal. If something's eternal, it can never stop. Amen? For if it stops, it was not eternal. I mean, it's just that simple. I mean, I don't need a Greek philosopher to tell me that. I don't need some Hebrew scholar to tell me that. 
I mean, I've just got enough sense to know if God says eternal, it's eternal, amen. And when God says He gives us eternal life. Now, let me just say this tonight. If salvation can be lost, now I'm talking about the doctrine of salvation, the pillars upon which the doctrine of salvation rests. If salvation can be lost, I want to know from the Bible what sins, how many of those sins, and at what point do I lose my salvation? It's an interesting thing to me that people who claim they can lose salvation and cuss people like me, and, I, and I'll just be honest with you, once in a while I get some preacher or somebody write me a, a letter in the mail, you know, and I, but here's your CD back, I, don't, I listen to it, and you believe that somebody can't lose salvation, you're, you're an apostate, blah, 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 you know, and all this stuff, you know. And I have never have had anybody to this day take an authorized Bible and show me what sin, what, how many sins, and at what point I lose my salvation. Oh, they can say, well, there's a point. I, okay, show me. Amen. Now listen to me tonight. Uh, it's funny to me too that those same people never do themselves get born again, 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 again. They get rededicated. You go to their revivals and they don't say, oh, bless God, so and so got up here and he got saved the 16th time tonight. They'll never say that. They always say, he, read it, he rededicated his life to the Lord tonight. You know why? Because they've got a problem in their spirit, and they know what they're saying don't make sense if you read your Bible. You don't hear anybody, I never have heard one of them preachers get up and say, I've been born again 14 times. How many ever heard anybody say that? I've never heard it in my entire life. Now let me say to you tonight, I believe in being saved and knowing you're saved and the Holy Ghost bearing witness, and I'm telling you what, if you know me and anything about it, Tonight you can be fooled and you can be, I mean, the devil can deceive you. But I'm talking about if you got blood washed, born again. I'm talking about tonight if you got saved, amen. I'm talking about God moved in, the devil moved out, and there's a new creature born in Jesus Christ to you tonight. I'll tell you, first of all, tonight, some people just don't know the doctrine of salvation. They've not been taught. They're kind of innocent to deal. I was raised that way. I was raised in the church. I didn't never know. I never knew whether I saved lost. I had no idea. I, I just, you know, hoped I wound up, hoped my good outweighed the bad in the end. I mean, tell you what, finally got the point. I give up. Forget it. Ain't no use. I'm too wicked. It'll never outweigh. My good will never outweigh my bad. At least one thing about it, I was honest enough to didn't deceive myself to think that my good was outweighing the bad. But I was raised that way. Didn't know no difference. You know, you know what? I never came to understand it until I started reading the Bible for myself. Now, I'll tell you, as long as you sit on the pew, now, whatever I preach, check it out in the Bible, amen. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. The way to keep from getting fooled and deceived is read your Bible. Then, by the way, not knowing that, but you can get hooked up in a denominational setting until you can be scared that you'll be cut off if you change what you believe. I mean, you're so scared to be cut off from your denominational buddies. That you will not believe the Bible for fear of what people... Oh, my goodness, don't tell me you started believing that damn little heresy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Amen. And fear of man will snare you and attack you from believing the truth. I don't say tonight, others are willfully... They willfully reject the truth of God's Word. And there's a reason they reject the truth of God's Word, because of self-righteousness. Because their whole apparatus of salvation is propped up on how good they are. Compared to how good somebody else is. Now tonight, others, as I say, because of self-righteousness, but some because of their wolves in sheep's clothing who are teaching a false salvation. Amen. They know what they're doing. I mean, tell, now listen to me. The average lost man out here who does not make any profession of faith, if he has an honest heart, knows that he cannot attain righteousness by how good he is personally. He knows he's a sinner. And by the way, there's a lot of lost men within 20 miles of here. The reason they're not saved is because to this day they don't understand salvation. To this day they think they've got to quit smoking to be saved. To this day they think they've got to do this or that or the other to be saved. To this day they think it's performance that saves them. And they've tried it and they cannot perform. Now, the first thing I want to say tonight, the first pillar is God's provision. You say, Reggie, the doctrine of salvation, eternal salvation, is based upon what's the first pillar? It's God's provision. God's provision. Genesis chapter 2 teaches us this, where Abraham took Isaac up to Mount Moriah to offer him, and according to God's commandment. And the Bible said they got up there, and this is what Abraham said, 
God Himself will provide a lamb. God will provide Himself a lamb. Let me tell you something. Salvation is God's provision. Salvation is God's provision. It's not man's provision. When Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to put on fig leaves. But God provided a sacrifice. Salvation is a provision of God. That's a pillar to the truth of eternal salvation. It is God, not you, that saved you. Amen. Christ, Christ is God's provision. Not my righteousness, but Christ is God's provision. Salvation, listen to me. Salvation is not a self-help program from heaven. Salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says. Salvation is of God. Salvation. He's the Savior. I'm the saved. I'm not saving myself. He is the sacrifice. I'm the one who He's saving. Salvation. The first pillar is that it's God's provision. God provided the sacrifice. God provided the Savior. God provided the salvation. Tonight, brother, I want to tell you something. We're not, God's not providing 80% of it, you 20. God's not providing 50 and you 49. I'll tell you, He provided all of it. Amen. I tell you, I'm going to heaven strictly upon the merits of Jesus Christ who died in my place upon the cross of Calvary. I'm not going to heaven on how good I am. I'm not going to heaven on how many years I preached. I'm not going to heaven on how I dress. I'm not going on heaven whether I cuss or don't cuss, whether I chew or don't. I'm going to heaven on the basis of the blood of Jesus sacrificed for my sin. Amen. I'm going to tell you something tonight. Some of y'all say hot dog. Amen. If you can't say hallelujah, say hot dog. Number two tonight. Number two. I'm say what some I was riding in a car one time. The guy said, you don't believe in once in Greece, always in Greece, do you? I said, no. <laughs> no, I don't. Never heard of it. What are you talking about? Oh, he said, you know those people that believe you can't lose your salvation. I said, you wouldn't be talking about John 3.16, would you? You wouldn't be talking about eternal life, would you? Well, uh, maybe we better not go there. The second pillar is not on the first pillar. is God's provision. Amen? It's God's provision. Now, some of you, the problem is you just need to get happy about being saved. Some of you got saved and you've never been happy about it since. You need to get happy about being saved. Amen? If you understand Bible salvation, you can't help but be happy in the Lord. I'll tell you, the second pillar is God's greatness. God's greatness. Not my greatness, God's greatness. We serve a great God, amen? In John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29, he said this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, you've got a King James Bible with you, don't you? Now, I, I like to use the term authorized version. I really don't like to use the word King James. King, he was just king when God authorized it to be done. But I want you to go to John chapter 10, and I want you to look up that passage of Scripture with me tonight. John chapter 10, and look at verse number 27 with me. If I can get there after a while, I know it's in here somewhere. John chapter 10, if you look in there, there's something I want you to notice. The word man, in both verses 28 and 29, is in italics. Now, if you don't know what that means in your authorized Bible, the Word of God, what the translators were telling you is this, that the word man, anything that's italicized, the authorized version, is not in the original manuscript. Follow me. All right? They're just honest enough to tell you. That's why this is an honest book. All right? Now, because, the reason I bring that out is because a lot of people say, well, it says no man can pluck you out of his hand. But the devil can. Well, I'm going to tell you, I challenge that. Because the Bible said, greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. You know what? They don't serve a great God. If I didn't have a God that wasn't great enough to keep me, I'd trade him off for another and amen. Woo! Hot dog, amen. Hallelujah. Brother, I tell you what, we've got a great God tonight, amen. He said, neither shall any man pluck him. My Father, which gave to me, is what? Greater than all. We serve a great God tonight, and one of the pillars of eternal salvation is that we've got a great God tonight. He's a great God tonight. Amen. Boy, I'll tell you something tonight. The greatness of our salvation is the Father, not the flock. Hey, 
You see, it's not me, it's Him, amen. And it's the greatness of God. Not the flock, not the Savior, it's the greatness of God that is the pillar of, of my faith tonight. I want to tell you something. God says nobody's going to pluck me out of His hand. I mean, the devil's not. You're not. I'm not. I preach your saint. I want to tell you something. Listen, tonight, I'm glad I've got a Father. I'm in His hand. Amen. In the Old Testament, it said I'm graven upon the palms of His hand. But I want to tell you something. Tonight, I've got a great God. Greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. Number three pillar. The pillar of our salvation is God's love. In Romans chapter 8, turn to Romans chapter 8, the Bible said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as is written, for, for, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Listen, brother, he was writing to people who were dying for Jesus' sake. And he was confirming to them that nothing could separate them from the love of God. Not even death, not even being, not, not even being sacrificed. He said, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, and I think God wants you to be persuaded, that neither death, hey, death ain't going to separate you from God. Death's going to usher you into the presence of Almighty God. Hey, man, it's a freight train taking you straight into glory. Life, nor angels, isn't the devil an angel? He's a fallen angel. Nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other. What? Now, I want to ask you something. Somebody says, well, I can take myself out of the Father's hand. Well, you're a creature. And any other. It said, ain't no other creature <laughs> can separate you from the love of God. Amen. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, you know what those people will say? They'll say, well, now it says you can't separate you from the love of God. It didn't say you couldn't separate you from God. Well, I got news for you. God is love. Amen. And I don't believe you can take that context and try to carve that out. You've got to be, I mean, forcefully trying to put a round peg in a square hole trying to do that. Amen. I'll tell you something. Listen to me. Paul said, who shall separate us? He's talking about a separation from God here. He said, can't happen. Amen. Uh, let me give something to you. In Genesis chapter 7, Noah, God told Noah to build an ark. And how many of you know that ark was a picture of Jesus Christ? Amen. It is a foreshadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our ark, and we're called to come into Him. And when you come in, He shuts the door. Amen. Hey, uh, Noah didn't catch it. Now, come on in, kids. And then he grabbed the door handle and shut it. He would have sunk. God shut it, and God sealed it. Amen. Now, let me tell you something. If you believe that, that somebody that's saved can lose their salvation, if one of those eight people had been able to get the door open, watch this, how many of them would have drowned? And let me ask you this. The ark is a picture of who? The ark would have sunk. Ain't happening. Amen. Somebody ought to say hot dog right there. Amen. Brother, I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. It's a picture of eternal salvation, and he took him clear through to the other side. He didn't get him halfway through the flood and say, oh, my goodness, I think we're going to sink. Get out of this ark. Amen. It's, it's, I'm talking about the pillar of God's love. Boy, I'm going to tell you something. God so loved us to give his son. I'm going to tell you something. He ain't going to let us go back to the devil. Amen. Now. The pillar of God's perseverance. This is important. I believe in the doc Bible doctrine of perseverance. You know what perseverance means? You just keep on keeping on. You just keep on enduring. You just keep on going. You ain't quitting. You may fall down. You may crawl for a half a mile. How many ever just crawled for about three or four years in your Christian experience? I have. Some of you is down there in the ditch now. You just crawling, Amen. But you know what? Just because a baby crawls don't mean he ain't a human being. Just because a baby crawls doesn't mean he ain't alive because salvation is a birth. The pillar of God's perseverance. Philippians chapter 1. Don't turn there. Just listen. I want to preach. Be confident. Be confident of this very thing. This very thing. You know what the word very means? It means an absolute. Verily, verily I say unto thee. He said, be confident of this very thing. He which hath begun a good work in you 
will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you know what God is saying? I ain't starting with you and then not finishing with you. Amen. You know what the Bible said in Hebrews chapter 12? He is the author and the finisher of our salvation. You didn't start it. You ain't finishing it. He's finishing it. Amen. I'll tell you something. Did you know what I'm doing? I'm just sitting in the ark of riding. Amen. I'm riding right over the waters of this old world. Every once in a while I get up and go clean a stall somewhere. Or feed a camel. Amen. But I'll tell you something. I'm riding in the ark. I'm resting in His finished work. I'm done. I'm, listen to me tonight. The pillar of God's perseverance. Did you know what Galatians chapter 3 verse 3 said about this? these people had come in to bewitch the Galatian believers with this losing your salvation business? Do you know what the Apostle Paul said? The Holy Ghost said, Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye made perfect by the flesh? Woo! Are you so foolish that having begun being birthed of the Holy Ghost of God, now you're going to finish the flight in the flesh? Now here's what the Galatianites all believe. You got saved. Mary, have you quit using dope since you got saved? <laughs> you're not quite sure? Okay. I take Tylenol too, amen? Here's what I'm saying to you. They'll say you got saved. You mean to tell me that you still watch as the world sins and spins? Are you still watching as the world turns and vomits? How can you be saved and watch how the world sins and spins? You mean to tell me you're... Are you still sucking on that cigarette, Danny, friend? I hear he's chewing skull that he's got a spit can in his garage and when the preacher comes around, he throws it away. He's nodding his head. I didn't know it, did he? (laughs) Hey, listen to me. Are we so foolish to think that it takes the Holy Ghost to save us, but we're kept saved by the work of our flesh? Paul said, that's stupid. That don't make sense. Listen, it's the Spirit of God all the way. Amen. The works of my flesh. You know what the works of my flesh is? Adultery, fornication, murder, lasciviousness, uncleanness. Evil thoughts. That's the works of my flesh. I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I know that there's no profit in my flesh. That which is the flesh is of the flesh. It's raven food. Amen. That's exactly right. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you something. We need a revival around here. Just a happy revival. Amen. Boy, listen to me. Listen to me tonight. I'm going to say this, but being confident in this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will complete, uh, finish it the day of the Lord. Now listen to me tonight. Whenever we was on the tabernacle up here, when that's, watch this, watch this. Y'all know that the, here, here comes a man with his lamb. This is so good. He brought his lamb in there. He takes it up to the priest. And the priest, and he lays his head, the, the, the man lays his head on it, transferring by symbol. His sin to that to that substitute. Now watch this. Did you know that from that moment on, it's all the priest. Woo! Think about it. The priest is our great high priest, Jesus Christ. From that moment on, it's all the high priest. All that sinner had to do was bring the lamb. All that sinner had to do was transfer by faith in that substitute. From that point on, the lamb took it all. The, the, the priest took care of it all. He cut the throat. He shed the blood. He sprinkled the blood. He went into the Holy of Holies. Amen. Jesus paid it all. The high priest did it all. Amen. I just came to the cross. Said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the priest took it all into the Holy of Holies. Woo! I hope the devil's sitting outside going, I don't like it. I don't like it. Number five, four, five, six, seven, eight, who knows? It's the pillar of God's power. My salvation rests upon the pillar of God's power. Boy, in 1 Peter chapter 1, it says this, Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, under obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. But then he, boy, jumps up and says, Blessed be 
the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Watch this. To an inheritance. He begot us. In other words, he birthed us into the family of God to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, the next verse says this. And I think the Holy Ghost knew he was going to need it. That's why he put it there. Who are kept by the power of God. Power of God is what kept you. The power of God is a pillar of the doctrine of eternal salvation. I want to tell you something. Listen to me tonight. The power of God is what's keeping me tonight. It's not the power of my performance. It's not the power of my position. It's the power of God tonight that saves me and keeps me saved. The Bible said in verse number 3, according to His abundant mercy, it says it's an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that faileth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Then number 6 tonight, there's the pillar of God's immutability. Now, that's a big word tonight, and I'm trying to impress you, but it is a Bible word. For it says, and turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6 tonight. Hebrews chapter 6. I've I, I got to say this, and I hope it don't make anybody mad. But you know what? I'm telling you, Donnie, that's one of the best Sunday school times I've ever sat in this morning when you read through the book of James. Did you know that was pure water rolling right down the stream? Hey, man. I don't tell you what I thought there, and I thought, you know, 20 some years ago, Donnie couldn't have read through that. Now, I'll tell you what, he could be a pretty good reader, amen. I mean, he misses one every once in a while. Now, I never do, but he misses one every once in a while. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I said to him, I thought, God, you know what you've done. You've taught that man how to read by reading your word. Right. Amen. God up and read the whole book of James, one of the best Sunday school classes I've ever said in my life. Why, if you don't think the Holy Ghost wasn't preaching to us while you was reading, you lost your mind. Man, the Holy Ghost speaking to me here, speaking to me there, speaking to me here. I don't tell you what I think what I do have Sunday school classes. Read the Bible, amen. Oh, 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 oh Haley Handbook, one, uh, I never will forget this. I haven't been preaching five months, and somebody gave me an old time Haley's Bible Handbook. Now, the old kind I'm talking about. And back there, he said, if you can't preach with the power of God on you, he said, at least just read the Bible, sing, pray, and go home. He said, just reading the Bible, singing and praying is better than a lot of this dead preaching going on. Amen. Hey, man. Think we've got to get up here and give three points to the poem? What was I preaching on anyway? The immutability. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 17. That Bible said, wherein God... Willing more abundantly to show unto who? The heirs of what? Promise. How many has ever been made a promise and then been lied to? Lied to. They told you they would do such and such and did not do it. Did you know what God, that the devil has accomplished? What's this? By propagating the doctrine that you can lose your salvation? He is propagating, making God out to be a liar. If God promised you eternal life and He doesn't give it to you if you place your faith in Christ, then God would be a liar. Just that simple. Now, you can't have it both ways. Either He's telling the truth or He's not. Either His Word's good or it's not. If His Word's not good, He's no good. Amen. Look what it said. Verse 17. He said, Show unto the heirs of promise, here it is, the immutability. My, doesn't that sound learned? The immutability of his counsel and he confirmed it by an oath. Now, what does immut- immutability to me? It means God ain't going to change his mind. Right. Are you listening to me? It means God don't lie. It means God ain't changing his mind not one bit. Now, watch what it says here. That by two, verse 18, by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a weak consolation. Hey, we might have what? Strong, Strong consolation. Now, I'm not promoting vain fleshly confidence. I would destroy that if I could. But I'm promoting scriptural, Holy Ghost, Bible-based confidence in God. I don't tell you about people that knows the truth. They have a strong consolation because they know God don't lie. They know God keeps His promises. 
They know God's not fooling with their soul. They know God's not chasing them and aggravating them about whether they're going to go to heaven or hell. They know God says something God means it. Amen. They can bank on it. Here's what he said. They have strong consolation. Who have fled where the they, they fled from the world. They fled from sin. They fled from the devil. They fled for refuge in Christ. To lay hold upon the hope set before us. Watch this. Which hope? We, now, what is hope? Hope is a well-founded, well-grounded, knowing that what God has said he'll do and do. That's hope. Which hope we have is what? Anchor for the soul. Anchor for the soul. Both what? Questionable. Sure. He said it's an anchor of the soul. Man, love, there, isn't there a song about this? I've anchored in Jesus. I've anchored in Jesus. Now watch what this says. Talking about the tabernacle here. Which entereth into that within the veil. Hey, I'm on this side. I have a veil of flesh. I can't see Jesus. I can't see, I can't see God. But by faith, I have Christ in my heart as my Savior. I have an anchor inside the veil. Where's inside the veil? That's the holy of holies. That's the most holy place. That's the presence of God. I've got an anchor in there. Amen. Buddy, I'm going to tell you something. I'm, God's got the anchor. Oh, said, but what if the anchor slips? You just don't know God. I'm sorry. You, you just don't have any concept about God, right? You don't know the God of the Bible. God don't slip. God don't slip. Amen? I'm going to tell you what. I don't know if you're having a good time, but I'm going to have a good time until I lose my voice. Amen? I'll tell you like what old Abraham Lincoln said. He said, you ought to preach like you're fighting a hive of bees. Just come a swarming. Amen? The immutability of God. Let me tell you something. Salvation's an unconditional blood covenant. Oh, Abraham's a father of faith. God said, all right, Abraham, we're going to make us a covenant. You get them animals, lay them out there, split them in two. I'll come down, me and you'll walk together through that, and we'll have us a covenant. Oh, Abraham, he cut up all the birds, cut up all the animals, sat there, and God didn't come. You know why God didn't come? He's waiting for Abraham to get past his self-righteousness. And Abraham drove the birds away. He said, get out of here. Buzzards come in, wanted to eat on them dead animals. He chased them birds away, and he got the tar, and he sat down back over again, and pretty soon old Abraham went. And he did like some folks do in church. He went to sleep. <laughs> I just had to throw that in. I'm going to tell God on you. He went to sleep. And the Bible said a great horde of darkness. You know what? And then all of a sudden, here come this burning lamp. You know what? It was like God said, Abraham, I was just waiting for you to get done with all your ability. I was waiting for you to get done with all your self-righteousness. And I was just wanting to show you that it's all me and none of you. And while you are sleeping, I'm saving your soul. Now, God's got a blood covenant with us, and he's going to keep his covenant. And you know what? Hey, an unconditional covenant means that you ain't got anything to do with it. It's all up to God. Amen. Amen. By the way, now watch this. Blood covenant. Who was to shed blood? I can throw you a little something about the circumcision of Jesus Christ and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. You better think that one over. One's Godward, one's manward. One mediator between God, man, the man, Christ Jesus. A little bit deep on the deal right there, but hang on to that one. Your hat. We'll study that one out, all right? God's mutability. Brother, I'm going to tell you something. It's an unconditional. By the way, God says it's a gift. The boy told me he lost his salvation. I said, I guess God walked up for and said, hey, give that gift back. I'll give you a gift if you're going to like. Give it back to me. How many thinks God's like that? What kind of God they worship in any way? Yeah, false God. You're exactly right. You can't find the Bible. Nowhere, no shape of no kind where God walked up to a guy and says, I'm going to take that gift back. Is salvation not a gift? Yes, sir. You see, that's the real crux of the matter because, you know, if, you, if it's by your how well you live, then it's not really a gift, is it? And if it's by how well you live, then Jesus really isn't enough, is he? You see how you become your own God? You're an idolater. The fifth, the next pillar is God's promise. In John 6, 37, listen to this. It said, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And watch this. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He said, I will in no wise cast out. You know what that means? Under no circumstances will God cast his children away from him. 
I mean, I intend to keep the babies awake tonight. Amen. Boy, listen to me tell you, I want you kids to know something. I want you to know the God you serve, the God you worship, and I want you to know the salvation He's given you, and I don't want you horsed around for 45 years by the lies of the devil. I'm telling you tonight, the pillar of God's promises. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Well, well, yeah, but I can leave God. Wait a minute. He said he would never leave me. If I run over here, he's not going to leave me. If I run over there, he's not going to leave me. It's all up to him, not me. You understand? Well, I can leave God. You bet you. You have 42 times and you know it, you sorry low down thing. That's what some of a bunch of y'all say, hot dog right there. I'll tell you what, folks, if you don't keep you, you're not kept. You know what there is in this world? There's a bunch of people who think that if you smoke and, and chew, you're lost. But they think it's just fine for them to be covetous of their neighbor's farm. Because you can't see covetousness very often. It's that old deep heart junk. Oh, they think if you drink a beer, you're lost. And I hate drinking like a, I mean, I hate drinking. By the way, if you're drinking here tonight, you ought to get on that altar and say, God, forgive me and cleanse me up and take it away from me. Amen. And I don't see how anybody can drink and say there's a Christian. But you know, there's people out here who think that you take a drink, you're lost. But it's okay for them to sit around and secretly lust after somebody else's wife that nobody knows about. Huh? I'll tell you what, them old sins of the heart down inside where nobody can see is where the real you and I is at, amen? And it's all those external stuff, you know. Oh, if your dress is too short, you're not. You're not. Can't be saved. I think you ought to dress modestly too. But you know what? You could dress modestly until you live to be 132 and die and go to hell with a long dress on. Yes, that'd make a good song, dying and going to hell with a long dress on. <laughs> Amen. I can just hear somebody rapping that out over KTTS. <laughs> dying and going to hell with a long dress on. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, I'll tell you something. Listen, that's the way it is. I mean, tell you what, they've got their little set of rules and their little set of myths, and they ain't got nothing. I asked him then one day, he's telling me all this stuff caused you to lose salvation. I said, hey, where'd the blood of Jesus come in at? Where's that count for anything? The pillar of God's promise, I'll never, I'll never leave thee for say. He said, I'll, he said, all that comes to me. He said, oh, how many? All that comes to me, I'll know why it's cast out. Now, the next pillars, we got a good bunch of pillars, amen. I think it's resting pretty good. The next was the pillar of preservation. John chapter 6, verse 39 and 40 says this, And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. That's God's preservation. Do you know what God said? Jesus said, he told in John chapter 17, he said, Of all thou hast given me, I have lost none. Watch this, say, the son of perdition, Judas Iscariot, the devil in the flesh. He said that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Don't you tell me Judas was saved. He was the most classic picture of a lost church member you've ever seen in your life. Uh, he kissed the face of Jesus. While he had the silver in his back pocket betraying him. Everybody goes to church ain't saved, folks. Everybody preaching ain't saved. Everybody that claims to be serving God ain't doing it because they're saved. I mean, do we really believe what the Bible said about false prophets and false teachers and that there'll be lots of them and they'll deceive many? <clears throat> the pillar of preservation. Again, being confident in this very thing that he which have been done a good work and you perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. All that he has given me, I should lose nothing. And then there's the pillar of the Holy Spirit's seal. Brother, let me tell you, the Bible said in Ephesians chapter 1, In whom also ye trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed. <clears throat> Listen to me. Did you, did you catch that? It said after that you believed. It didn't say after that you were baptized. Yeah. didn't say after that you quit smoking. didn't say after that <laughs> you started dressing right. It said that after that you believed. Watch what happens. God said after you believed. Ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and the praise of His glory. Now you say, Reggie, what's a seal? A seal is a documentation as to the authenticity and the authority, the power, 
the name, the security, and the identification of the, per- of the person enacting the transaction. Sealed until the day of redemption. Now, to a good old hillbilly boy like me, the best thing I've got, I know all about the U.S. seal and the, and the Missouri State seal. But you put that on that document, it means something. Amen? And it's recorded and sealed. Now, I'll tell you, when my mama was, when I was little, I used to help my mama can. They didn't have no sisters. I was poor, poor thing. You ought to feel sorry for me. I had to do dishes and vacuum and all that kind of stupid junk, of which I do no more since I met Karen. Amen. I repented of my ways when I left home. I ain't just said, I'm marrying me a dishwasher. I'm marrying me a vacuum sweeper runner. I'll tell you, how many's ever polished silver to you? Ugh. That'll, but anyway, my mom used to can, and I, of course, I got in on the canning business. And I remember my mom said, I said, well, how do you know? I said, how, how, how's that state? Well, she said, it seals. She said, how do you know it seals? She said, some of you don't know. You've made it out of cans so long. You have no idea. You heathen. You've never canned a green bean you raised in your life. You just eat off of them wick cans. Amen. Amen. Some of you ought to grow. You ought to just commit to God. This year I will not eat out of a can. I'll eat out of the garden. Amen. Go on a weight loss program and health diet. Amen. But I'm saying this. It's a seal. And that's what kept that preserved in there. And if it didn't, you know what happened? If the one of them didn't seal, what happened? It'd fall. It'd get rotten. Couldn't eat it. Somebody says, well, that's what might happen. The seal might pop and you'd fall. Well, now wait just a minute. Who's doing the sealing? Whose seal is it? God's seal. Now, I don't know about you, but I just can't imagine God's seal popping loose. Amen? Now, if you want to live in that kind of world, I guess you help yourself. But I don't want to live in that kind of world. I, ain't going, I, I, I will not worship a God like that. If my God's not big enough to keep me and keep his promises, I ain't worshiping him. I promise you. I would have quit the ministry 15, 20 years ago if I couldn't believe what this book says. Oh, let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you about the earnest. He said, not only is he the seal, he said, but he's the earnest. He said, that Holy Ghost is the earnest of the purchased possession until the day of redemption. Now, I'm going to tell you something. God don't deal real estate. God don't do transactions like men do. Now, men come in and want to put a dollar down on a million dollar piece of property. Ain't that right, Mary? Now, they wouldn't write up a contract. Here, we're going to put a dollar down earnest money. You know why that's so they can back out of the deal? And then they want to put contingencies in the contract. Yeah. Now, this contract's contingent upon Mama giving me a million dollars when she dies, and I'm praying for the day. <laughs> and this contract's contingent upon Uncle Joe dying and me inheriting 500000 And it's contingent upon the bank. And it's contingent, contingent, contingent. And you got to <laughs> just light a fire with that one. Amen. It's not worth the paper it's written on. I like the sales that I do at auction. As is, where is? Cash on the barrel head. Amen. Ten percent down. How many knows if I sold you a piece of property for 20000 and you paid 2000 down, you ain't going to walk away from that very easy. Do you know that? You're going to say, good land, you mean you're going to keep my money? I sister, I'm going to keep your money. I tell her, I get up and say, now folks, we fix to sell this property, and you're going to have to pay ten percent down right now when the sale's over with. Then 30 days from now, you're going to have to close. And don't bid if you don't want to close because I'm going to keep your money. And I don't want you thinking I lied or deceived or manipulated you. You will lose your money. Don't do it. Don't write that check. Don't bid unless you're ready to close. Now you say, well, God put an earnest down on your salvation. You know what I'm saying? Your salvation will not be fully executed until your resurrected body at the resurrection. Do you know that? Because your salvation involves your spirit, your soul, and your body. God put an earnest payment down. How many knows what he put down? Himself. The Holy Ghost. You won't do no better than that. You know what Donnie would be like? It would be like you putting one of your sons down for an escrow deposit on a farm. You're not going to walk on that one. You're going to finish that deal. God put His Son, God put His Spirit down in earnest. That's why they call it earnest money. 
He's earnest. He means it. He's not joking. And let me say this. To say that he doesn't mean it. Why don't you just look at them right now and say, I think you're a joke. I think you're lying to me. I think I could lose it. It scares me. It scares me. It makes goosebumps run up down my back to think about me looking up at God saying, you gave your son, you gave your spirit, you gave his life, you gave his blood, you promised me eternal life, but I don't think it is. Then there's the pillar of our position. We're in Christ. The whole book of Ephesians says, you know, it's in Christ, in whom, in Christ. In Christ. And then the Bible said that he dwells in us by his spirit. That reciprocal dwelling. Us in Christ and Christ in us. If any man, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. It's Christ in us. It's our position in Christ. We're the body. He's the head. The church is the body of Christ. Is Christ going to throw his bride in hell? And I finish with this one. The pillar of a new creation. The book of Peter tells us that we've been made partakers of the divine nature. Any man being Christ, he's a new creature. Now you listen to me. Salvation's a new creature. Religion's an overhaul. Salvation is a new man in the old suit. Religion is a new suit on the old man. Boy, let me tell you something. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. I I, I cannot believe how few people believe the Bible when it comes to this situation. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 9 and verse number 10. The Bible said in the New Testament epistles, Paul talked about, he said, which is created in true righteousness, having been begotten again. We're born in the Spirit of God. Hey, let me tell you something. Salvation is a birth, Amen. It's a birth. It's a creation of a new creature in Jesus Christ. There's somebody been born again in the Spirit of God. There's a new creature in here. How many believe there's a new creature created of the Holy Ghost of God? That's what it is. It's not, it's not God overhauling you. It's a new person inside. And you still have the old flesh. But you have, the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And the two are contrary. One to the other. So that you cannot do the things you But if you be led of the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the works of the flesh. Now, here's a verse of Scripture that almost every Bible commentator and preacher in the country chokes on. I mean, they they start reading down here, they go... (laughs) Because it's just so starking, I mean, it's just so in your face, true. They cannot take it. Verse number 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Ninety-nine percent, of, maybe a hundred percent. I don't know that I've ever read anybody. Anybody you read after on that verse, they'll, they'll say that means that Christians will not have the habit of sin, sinning. That sounds good, and I don't think Christians ought to have a habit of sinning. But to, sorry, but that's not what it says. It says, "Whosoever is born of God doth not sin, doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin." Because he was born of God. The new creature that you were born, when you got saved and the Holy Ghost birthed a new creature in you, what was it conceived of? What were you, what, what Jesus tell Nicodemus, he must be born again of the Spirit. What's the first name of the Spirit? Holy. He's not talking about nice, he's talking not about kind of holy, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. When you were saved, the Holy Spirit, sinless Holy Spirit, Birth the new creature in Jesus Christ within you. And that is that new man that the Bible talks about over and over again. It is that new creature in Jesus Christ created. What's this? What's this? Listen. Created in true righteousness and true holiness. And there's a reason the Holy Ghost said that. It's because we're not careful. We'll carve out our own idea of righteousness and holiness. 
God says, oh, no, 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 you ain't getting away with that. The new man is created in true righteousness and true holiness. And he is a new man conceived of the Holy Ghost of God. And God says, the new man does not sin, cannot sin. Now, you may choke on that. That's what the Bible teaches. You have a flesh nature. Watch this. You have a flesh nature don't do nothing but sin. Every click of the clock on your flesh is nothing but sin. But that new man, that Holy Ghost conceived man, that new creature. And you, see, a lot of people don't, don't believe it's really a new creature. They just think God's kind of fixed them up and made them nice. Somebody needs to tell you, you're not nice. You're really not nice. You're pretty rotten, in fact, just like me. I mean, your sweetest little days stink in the sight of a holy God. But, oh, brother, listen to me tonight. That new man created in true righteousness and true holiness. And you look at that passage of Scripture. Whosoever is born of God, that's that person has been saved. That's that new man. That's not your flesh. That's that new man. Doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. I'll throw you a little intellectual junk. That in the Greek, that word cannot is a triple negative. means he cannot at any place, any time, under any circumstances. Mm. I'm telling you, most people choke on that one. But you know why? Why the devil wants to choke on it? Because it's a pillar of the doctrine of salvation. Amen. Well, I want to tell you, I want you to understand something. Now, now listen, do me good. I want you to understand something. The Bible says there's many deceivers. In Matthew chapter 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus finishes it out by saying, or toward the end says, by saying this. In that day many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not done many mighty works in thy name? In thy name to cast out devils. And I mean, they were a religious, wild crowd. They did a lot of nice stuff. You know what he said? Watch this. I say unto them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I, let's do it. I never knew you. He didn't say, I, you know, I used to know you, but you messed up and I don't know you now. No, he said those people were religious people. They were church people. They were, I mean, they were, they were, I mean, they were swinging big apples. And he said, I never knew you. What God is teaching us very clearly, folks, is that, you know, DNA, DNA is a funny thing. It can prove who's your daddy and who's your not. I think in, in, in the world to come, I mean, I think at the judgment, some folks going to be surprised to find out their daddy wasn't their daddy. Mm. I believe in judgment, spiritually speaking, that some people who claim Christ as their father, God is going to open up the books and find out through the DNA analysis that they were a child of the devil and not of God. First John chapter 2 and verse 19, 19. Help me get over the hump on time. Because, you know, I say, well, Lord, what about these people who profess to be saved? I mean, I had some of them converts. Have you ever had any converts that just didn't turn out very well? I've had converts, you know. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like old, old Dwight L. Moody. He said he's going down the street one day and made an old drunk. And he says, hey, D.L., how you doing? D.L. says, fine, sir. How are you today? He said, don't you know me? I'm one of your converts. D.L. said, you must be. Because you sure ain't God's. Let me tell you what. This is doing good. Listen to this verse. They went out from us because they were not of us. Or if they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest, made known, that they were not all of us. God says there'll be people that'll put on the big show and they'll do, you know, for quite a while. But he said eventually they'll go out. And it'll be made manifest that they were not of us. Now watch. Listen to me carefully. He's not talking about somebody switching churches necessarily. Okay? He's talking about somebody who pretends to be part of the body of Christ. Pretends to be saved. But they went out of the, they went out of the faith. They went out of that fellowship. They went, I don't believe anymore. I used to be. No, no, no. God says no. They went out that it might be met. They were not of us. They went out from us because they were not of us. 
It didn't say they went out from us because they used to be part of us. No, no, it says they were not of us. God's very clear in the teaching. Hey, listen to me. See, Jesus said in John chapter, he said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Well, in second, Peter talks about the hogs and the, hogs and the dogs. Sheep is a clean animal. Hogs and dogs are unclean animal. Hogs and dogs always speak of those who are not saved but profess to be saved. It said the, the dog returns to his vomit and the sow to her wallowing. God never describes his born-again people as hogs and dogs. And yet they use that verse to say you can lose your salvation. Oh, the, the dog went back to his vomit and the sow went back to her wallowing. And try to pretend that that's applicable to save people? Ah. No, no. Sheep is God's people. And I'll tell you what you can do with a sheep. You can take a sheep and dump him in the mud. Hole. He'll jump up out there and get out of there. And did you know God's sheep maybe get in a mud hole? But they won't stay in the mud hole. Amen? They won't stay in the mud hole. Now, let me tell you what God's sheep will do once in a while. They get in the mud hole. Get up and shake it all off and then look around and wonder if God saw them. Anyway, let me tell you something. A salvation you can lose is no salvation at all. For Jesus did pay it all. Let's stand. Listen to me tonight. We'll give an invitation. No piano. We'll give an invitation to get something settled. The only way you'll ever slay the giant of doubt and get blessed assurance is by believing the truth. You are not going to get assurance by feeling. Oh, I feel saved. I'm your preacher. I've been preaching for 29 years nearly. John, did you know there are days I don't feel very saved? There are moments when I walked away from being stupid. He said, good land of living. How could a saved man act like that? The only basis of assurance I have is the pillar and the ground of truth. Now, there's two things here tonight. Some of you tonight may have never understood. And you just want to make sure tonight that your faith and your salvation and your assurance is in Jesus and his finished work. And you tonight want to give up all your self-effort and all of your righteousness, and you want to totally lay hold of the finished work of Jesus Christ, I want you to come tonight. You may be here tonight, and you've been doubting your salvation, but you want to thank God you know you're saved and saved forever, and that you've been given eternal life, and you'd just like to thank Him. Well, you may be here tonight, and you're lost, and you need to be saved, and you need to receive eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I just want us tonight to bow our heads in a word of prayer. And you just ask God, God, what, would, what do I need to do with this message tonight? Would you ask God that? What do I need to do with that message? Don't sit there and say, boy, we so-and-so have been here and heard this. God, what do I need to do with this message tonight? And I just want you to respond to the Holy Ghost work tonight. If you need to come and be saved tonight, I want you to come. If you need to come tonight and say, dear God in heaven, I'm tired of doubting. I'm going to lay hold on the truth, the pillars of the truth of salvation. And I'm going to settle this thing tonight, God. And I, I'm not going to allow the devil just to aggravate me from here to glory about wondering whether I'm saved or not. I place my faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe here tonight you just need to say, Oh, God, thank you for saving me and saving me forever. And thank you for his mercy. You just do what you think you need to do. Dear Lord Jesus, tonight, I want to thank you, God, that you had mercy upon my soul. And, God, that you made me to see one day from the Bible, Lord, that you saved a man eternally. You didn't play with my soul. You weren't playing games with my heart. God, you were saving me forever. God, I thank you and praise your holy name tonight that the salvation you give is eternal salvation in Jesus Christ. Oh, God, tonight I pray for these people that they'll get it settled once and for all and they'll not have doubts about their salvation and not, Lord, that they'll lay hold of these pillars of the truth of salvation and that that pillar, those, these pillars would uphold that doctrine in their soul and that the devil wouldn't be able to lie to them. And I pray, God, tonight that you'll help people just to lay hold of this thing God, if there's those here tonight that have never laid hold of the finished work of Jesus Christ, I pray they'll do so tonight. I pray, God, they'll put up that white flag of surrender and say, Jesus paid it all, and all to Him I owe. And, oh, God, tonight I pray that when we think about and meditate upon these facts, upon these truths, God, that I know what happens. The Holy Ghost will make us love You. Oh, God, it will make us fall in love with You like we never had before. When we see the end of ourselves and the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so, God, tonight we bless and praise your holy name. 
For a salvation that is sealed and finished in glory. A salvation sealed with the blood of your own Son. A salvation sealed with the earnest of the Holy Ghost of God. A salvation that is kept by the power of God. A salvation, Lord, that is authored and finished by our Savior. Oh God, tonight I pray. Lord, do a deep and lasting and wonderful work in our souls. And God, may it be to thy glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, I don't know who's come to do any business.